majority of what we do, and by we, you, you met Julie already as, as you walked in, and that's one of our, our students back there, Steve Lemperly, he's handing out cards to you. Um, the majority of what we do is trade the first hour. So we've been full-time professional equity traders since 1997. Uh, we met in graduate school and started doing this stuff, and um, my dissertation chairman was a guy named Peter, Peter Drucker. He was a big business guru back then. Um, and when I got done with my dissertation defense, he said, well, what are you going to do now? And I said, uh, you know, probably some consulting work for McKinsey or somebody, and uh, you know, don't really know yet. And he said, well, didn't you and your wife start a business in graduate school, and isn't it profitable? And I said, yes, we did. He said, well, as a business consultant of some notoriety, I can tell you that the hardest thing to do is start a business and get it profitable, so you might want to stick with what you're doing. So to the horror of our parents, right, six master's degrees between us and two PhDs, we never went out and did anything with them except for this stuff. We like teaching and we like talking to groups of people, um, and we publish. So everything that we're going to talk about today is first hour stuff that, that we do for a living. I've written tons of articles, you know, journal articles trading magazine articles over the years. They're in, um, you know, multiple languages. And this stuff has been covered and covered again because this, I think, is really sort of the sweet spot for equity traders. It says the first hour strategies, it gets you in front of the right kind of volatility every day, right? So you're able to capitalize on opening volatility. It keeps you away from bad volatility, the choppy stuff that happens during the, during the course of the day. I run into a lot of people who say, yeah, I make some money in the first hour, and then I give it all back the rest of the day. So our focus is right, we earn our living in the first hour, and then we shut down. Right? So that's, that's the extent of a day for us. So it's usually hour, hour and a half. Um, but definitely, when you join us in that room you know, over the next couple of weeks, you'll see that at you know, eight, my thing is always you guys can call me and ask me questions. I love hearing from everybody. Call me at 8.30 Pacific time because that's when I'm out hiking the canyon or walking on the beach. Right? So I did um, I've written a bunch of books about what we do. Right Around the Horn was the, the book that sort of encompasses everything. Trade Secrets focuses on uh, some of the strategies that we're going to talk about today. You don't have to buy the book. You just log into the site. There's a ton of videos. There's thousands of videos covering everything that we do. Um, and there's also explanations of all the strategies right on the site when you log in to see uh, you know, what it is that we're doing. So when you get this two-week open house, you can go to the service page, and on the trading plan page, you'll see every single trade plan that we've published since 2006 along with the results. So we've got our full blotters out there. We're showing everybody here's the way the trade was planned. It's sort of the core portion of our plan, the most replicable portion. And it shows you entry, stop, target, money management, and there's no BS, none of this like maximum favorable excursion stuff, none of this is just if you got in where you're supposed to get in and out at the target or out at the stop, how'd you wind up at the end of the year? Okay, so the years have all been profitable back to 2006. Results are there for you to look at, and let's get right into it because, like I said, it's a little, it's going to be a little information dense, probably a little different than. Uh, presentation that you're used to going to, but I just want to get through three strategies today and send you home with something you can actually work with tomorrow. So the first one, this is really the cornerstone of what we do. So this is a fastball expansion of range and volume, I call it. So the book originally, that Around the Horn book, when we were in grad school and I did my, my work on that, it was going to be called a multivariate analysis of covariance of the U.S. equities market, right? My publisher said, lovely, how many of these are you going to buy? Because he's, he's like, this is not going to jump off shelves. So I'm a baseball fan, so we decided, okay, let's, let's tinker with this and use a baseball metaphor for the pattern. Okay, so even though we stripped the statistic back out of a lot of these, the, the pattern plays out without running the actual statistic except for one example that I'm going to show you. But this first one, this is a no-brainer to spot on a chart. You see, when you're looking at a chart, you've got an expansion of range and volume. You want to make sure that the day that the expansion happens is the widest range of the past two weeks, right, 10 trading sessions. You want to make sure that volume is also 
significantly higher than it's been for the last 10 trading sessions. And you want to make sure, in this case, this is a short. So this example that I've got is a short sale. You want to make sure that it closes in the bottom 25% of the bar. So really what you want to see is, in the case of a long, you want to see it open low, close high. In the case of a short, open high, close low. It's got to be a big wide bar with a lot of volume accompanying it. So the next day for this core version of the plan, now we trade these differently for NYSE and NASDAQ. NYSE listed securities, we go 10 cents below the low would be our entry. Goes back to when we were trading an eighth of a point, right? Eight quarters. This, it was 12 and a half cents was what we were looking for when, when we would get picked in. Since decimalization, most of you, you know, it's probably the only thing you've ever traded. So we changed it to 10 cents for NYSE. For NASDAQ, we go a penny. So Na Ni NASDAQ's just a kick in. NYSE is still, you know, they're different animals. They're very different uh, trading vehicles, exchanges. Uh, you know, New York Stock Exchange is still run by a specialist who's running the stock. It has a definite personality. It reacts differently to support and resistance, whereas the NASDAQ is going to have a lot more price elasticity and things going on around your entries and all that. Prior day, right. Yeah. So you're always setting these up for tomorrow. So we're lousy at 6 o'clock in the morning, right? So what we do is we set everything up the night before. We pre-plan these things. I load my orders up the night before. And then in the morning, we're just sort of sitting there making sure that things play out, right? That everything triggers, that we don't get a short reject or something uh, that, that we have to go in and make a call. But 99% of this stuff, we just try to run. So on the, the short side of this, which is what we're going to look at, we're going to target underlying support on a daily chart. So every time we're setting up a trade, the setup, we find it on a daily chart, and we set up our profit objective on a daily chart. So we're going back and we're looking for the bodies of days, right? We're looking for real clear support and resistance, highs, lows, opens, closes, things that overlap. Places that you can see, we're order flow traders, right? And always have been. And we're looking for evidence of institutional buying and selling. So it doesn't matter. If an institution has to go back, if, if you see support down below and you look back on the chart and you say, well, this hasn't happened for the last two years, Bear in mind, an institution will sit on a losing trade for two years if it has to, so they won't book it. Right? Just look at your 401ks. They're sitting on stuff forever before they go and close out the position. That's because they're not going to they're not going to realize the loss. They have a bigger time frame. We target that support because we know that when it gets there, it's going to bounce. So it's just a real easy way of spotting your profit objective, and then. For the stop losses, we use intraday support and resistance. So we go to the five-minute chart. That's the time frame that we trade from. And on a five-minute chart, we find where's the real clear support and resistance. We look at it. As long as those things make sense in terms of each other, so on the NYSE securities, better than a one-to-one -one, uh, reward-to-risk ratio, we'll take the trade. Now, there's a second form of this. So like I said, if you go and you look at the, on the site, you're going to see that that trade, the NYSE trade, Books about $60 per share in profit per year. So that's just a raw number for that one trade. We, we have about 10 different patterns that we follow. The NASDAQ version of it, so far this year, is up 131 points per share. And it's just a little tweak to what we're doing when we trade these things. Um, essentially, what we did is I, I was running a hedge fund a couple years ago. We developed a program that goes through and looks for, okay, the pattern, just the pattern the way that it is, but then also goes through and matches order flow by institution. So you can roughly do this yourself without having to use alternative data feeds and all that kind of stuff, right? We can just go through and look at these setups and say, all right, well, if I go through the tape, how many times are there block trades going on? Because what we're looking for when we have it go back and scour the, uh, the intraday tape is, okay, how many times was, say, Goldman a, a buyer and seller of the security? How many times were they pushing price lower with what they were doing, and then how many times did they come in on the other side to prop price back up into the volume weighted average price, right, and then start selling again. And it just goes through and it analyzes this, and like I said, you can do this just eyeballing the tape too, right, you can just go through, find the patterns, find the ones that are most like the example that I'm going to show you, pick apart the tape, and say, all right, I can see here there's lots of block trading going off. If you don't see the block trades coming in from the exchange, you see them coming from an ADF, right, from an alternative display facility or, or you know, 
purple prints, the irregular prints coming in from uh, dark pools. You're just putting together the pieces of a puzzle to figure out where your best opportunities are. So in this case, right, the profit objective gets changed a little bit. So instead of just looking for your underlying support and resistance, we target on this one $1 for the first floor trader pivot that we're going to run in here. So that's just the result of a statistic that we ran down a million different ways. And we figured out that when you're dealing with these very, very high liquidity NASDAQ stocks that are being either, either marked up or marked down by an institution, typically you're going to hit your first support and resistance about a buck or at one of these pivot lines. Right? Pivot lines are just this you know, indicator to buy that's just built into 90% of your trading software has floor trader pivots as one of the built-in functions. So when we trade these, this is what we're looking for on a daily chart, right? So this is the short side again. You've got a big move down. You've got a trending move lower. It's followed by this pullback to the upside. And then you get your wide range bar. So that's expansion of range, hopefully some expansion of volume. The next day we're looking to get in just a tick below that, that expansion bar, right? in a five minute bar in that case, the next day we're gonna enter this trade and we're gonna target the dollar or target the floor trader pivot. And here's an example. So this one is from a couple of days ago, yesterday, I guess. Here you've got the chart the way that you typically see it, right? So when you're flipping through, so there's, there's great scanners for Metastock and TradeStation and uh, you know, every piece of software out there that has, has licensed the stuff that I do. I don't really use any of that stuff. I just flip through the charts. I go through about 1,100, 1,200 charts a night that meet my price criteria, and I find these things manually. In the case of the XRV, then we have it run down uh, the data afterwards to make sure we're getting that match. But as long as you've got that expansion of range, expansion of volume, and then this over here, this is called volume by price, um, or, or volume profile, depending on your software, right? This shows you where this occurred. So where was the volume inside this bar? And if you can get, um, if you can get a grip on the fact that you're getting heavy selling going into the close, heavy selling going into the middle of that bar, that gives you a real good feel then for where there's gonna be resistance to a move counter to what you're looking for the next day. Right, so it'd be very hard for price to get back up through this. So then I pull them up on a five minute chart, right? And I'm looking for this. I'm looking for really persistent selling over the course of a day, a big high pressure move that just never really lets up. And I'm looking for big volume going into the close. And I'm looking for levels that I can specify. These are really clear support and resistance levels, right? By volume. So you can go and, you know, you can draw a line anywhere on a chart and say I found support and resistance. But when you go and add, this volume component to it, volume by price, now you can go and say, well, is it really support and resistance, right? Is, it, is there gonna be something that really has to happen to undo what's happened here? And then a lot of times what I'll do as well is, this trading software that I use is called Realtick. Um, it's, it allows me to, to do volume weighted average prices over different time periods of the day. So what I'll do is I'll grab the two major moves as a session, see where the volume weighted average price is, and then see if, if I get into that closing range, right, and I have to undo all of that volume right there, how close am I to the VWAP for that closing window? So how, how many pieces of the puzzle are fitting together? I wanna have it so that I have to get through as much stuff as I possibly can in order to stop out of the trade. So in this case, this is how I would set this one up. So I told you guys, I set these up the night before, and um, you know what you see there is you had a, uh, a 39.76 entry on the short sale, a 39.71 uh, limit, right? So I'm only allowing this thing about uh, a nickel of slippage because that tends to be the case that they, they sort of they hit the entry price and then they go lower. You know, you're going to miss it the, the first go around, then it pops back up into your price. I've got my exit for a profit set up at. Uh, 38.71, I've got my exit for a loss set up at 39.96, right? The software shows me the balance of what that is, how much the, uh, the profit versus the loss is gonna be. I place that order and then we're off to bed, right? So the next morning, 
when I get up, my first job is I look at, okay, what's the, the usage indication for the ozone? And if I see that really what I'm looking at is, is the future's open, what's fair value, and then what does that imply as an ozone, right? So let's say I see a, you know, a 100-point drop in the futures, but we've got a, a 200-point positive fair value. That tells me we're going to be a really big gap to the downside. And then if it's more than, let's say, 160, 170 points, I just defer the order. And I wait. I just I let the market open. First five minutes of trading go by. Then I make a decision about whether to reinstate the order if it's an orderly market, right? If the market's not pounding all over the place. But if we just get an inline open, I just let these things go. Anything up to about 150 point gap, I just let these trades auto execute. So the, um, the benefit of doing a bracket order like this is that you get the whole order out there. Okay, so your whole order is out to the exchange before the exchange even opens. You know, there's no such thing as a stop order anymore, right? So when you put a stop order in, it's actually emulated at your, at your software. So wherever your software vendor is, he's, he's creating a, a, a virtual order for you. He's going to release that order when it's marketable. Right? So when it becomes a marketable order, when the price ticks, then your order goes out as a limit or a market order, but there's no such thing as a stop. What's great about these is the whole thing is there. It's an OCO order. It's going to kill the other leg of the order. If, if you get taken out for your profit, the other order gets canceled. Everything's beautiful, right? The bad thing about bracket orders is your order goes to, in this case, to real ticks, and when it gets to real ticks, it impounds the asset. So your margin impound happens the minute you place the order, whereas you, if you structured this as a traditional order, right, where it's held on your machine, then you say, all right, it has to open. In this case, it would have to open above my entry price and trade down through it. I don't want to get, I don't want to have a, a stock that gaps down and then trades up through me. I want to be moving in the right direction. If if I use a conditional order, it doesn't impound the, uh, it doesn't go and impound the, the margin, but it does add time to getting your order filled, right? So in this case, you know, you're probably adding a couple hundred milliseconds before your order gets from your machine to Townsend to the to Realtek, and then there's another probably 100 milliseconds before it gets to the exchange, whereas the bracket order is instant, you wind up getting filled almost every time. So that is the structure of this. And then here's the way these play out. I mean, typically, you know, so this one was uh, uh, the day before yesterday, right? And you can see exactly what we're looking for. So we've got the entry, uh, you know, lined out on the chart. It moves down to the entry price. We've got our profit objective down a dollar from where we got in. You know, it's very, you can see down there where the pivot line is. That's, that's S1. It did make it down kind of close to the pivot, but my experience is a dollar or the pivot, whichever one comes first is going to be the best exit. You know, and here it didn't make it to it. And when you go through and, you know, you look back at these historically, what you're going to see is that that, you know, that really winds up sort of tending to be the magic number. Yeah. The, so the, so there's two stops on this one. See those orange lines up there? So those are potential stops, right? So what I do is I set my stop wide initially, and then I wait for the market to open. And as soon as the market's open, I look at where the tick, uh, you know, where the, the primary tick volume is going on, and then I ratchet my stop down. So in real tick, when the order goes live, you can just click on the line, pull it down, and it'll change the order originally. When it when it first goes off, yeah. When it first goes off, it could be less than one to one. I I don't care on this on this version on this Nasdaq version, because I haven't actually planned exactly where I want the stop to be until the the very first couple minutes of trading goes by, and you're just going to pull it down. So and if if you're confused by that, then just sort of pay attention in the room next week, and you know we talk through it. So we make it a point to really just discuss what we're doing and why we're doing it because. At least half the people in there are trading this for a living. Um, the other half are trading these other exact trades that we're going to talk about. So that was on Tuesday. So this is typically what's, you know, this thing goes out, and it's just a, um, I, I, give the, I give you the, uh, whether it's a long or a short, I give you the, the chart. You find out where you're going to place your stop. I don't want everybody piling stops on in the same place. And Tuesday we did two bucks a share on this. 
We had uh, CSE and CDCE, those both hit on an identical target. So there's the equity curve on this thing this year. So this is the first year that we shared this with, uh, with our clients and uh, it's, it's averaging about $20 a month, uh, $20 per share traded per month. Okay, who's got questions? Well, they're that good, huh? That early? Yeah. Always more volume, yeah. More volume and more range together, always on your setup. So whether it's a NYSE version or the NAS version, you're looking for a day that had big volume build and big wide range, and preferably you wanna see real heavy volume later in the day, because what that shows you is, right, institutions doing a bunch of selling over the course of the session. And you sort of see a chicken bottom. Now, you know, back to, okay, we were order flow traders is where we started, right? Everything was about, okay, here's the relationship to the BWAP that we wanna maintain over the, over the course of the day. You're getting close to the end of the session, now you're making the phone call, okay, we, we were supposed to do 200,000 shares of this thing, we got 120,000 off, what do, you, what do you want us to do with the 80, right? And then when you see that, that heavy selling going into the close, that's a bunch of guys pushing, right? They're gonna, they just wanna get this done, they wanna get done as much as they can today, what you're betting on when you see that push is that tomorrow morning, if the stock doesn't climb back up into the range closer to today's volume weighted average price, that they're gonna start hitting it again and try to get done in the morning what they didn't get done the prior session before this thing extends even further into the recession. Yeah. Yeah. And it's out there. And if, if you're on RealTick, you can see that, you know, you can see the irregulars, you can see the, the uh, iceberg orders and all that stuff, so it, it helps. Yeah. Volume by price. Volume by price, volume profile. Um, in, uh, in TradeStation, they, they load it up in the matrix and you can see it there, but talk to us afterwards and I'll, I'll give you some hints, yeah. So, it, you know, if, I mean, if you want to talk workflow real quick, I think that's a good, that's a, a good question that everybody should consider. In our case, right, we do a lot of different trades. Because when you come to the site and you look around, you'll be like, okay, well, I, this one thing appeals to me, you know, but this other stuff he's doing doesn't, it, it doesn't make sense. Well, everything that we do appeals to us because we develop this stuff, right? So the way that this whole thing works is I'm sitting in front of my monitor, Julie's sitting in front of her. She trades is around the horn plan, which is much more, systematic and I, I find women are much better at being patient while they're trading, right? So she's got sort of the patience trades where she's nurturing these things over the course of the day. She's moving stops, they're a little, they're a little different. My trades, I usually have maybe six of those XRVs. I get them loaded up. My workflow is, and then I also trade, there's an Apple trade that I do every day, right? Around the A one. I load the Apple trade up before the bell, I don't even look at it. I just let that thing go, whatever it does, it does. Like I know the numbers on it, I know exactly how it plays out every time. I don't need to babysit that. I've got these trades that trigger a lot of times right at the open. So I've got six of these on a screen in front of me on a 30 inch monitor, right? I'm just looking to see, okay, where's it settling in? Where can I move my stop? Then five minutes in, I move to this trade. So now I've got those set and then you know, when you guys come into that room, it's, it's you know, Rick, the, so the guy who's moderate, all the people in that room are just people who've been through the boot camp and done the training and they, they just talk to each other and it's like you're gonna be walking into the middle of a conversation. But at the end of a week or two, you're really gonna get what's going on. And, you know, the guy who moderates it, you know, his thing is this opening gap trade. So he loves it, he focuses just on this, it's how he makes his living. So for us, Right, it's, it's, I'm trying to move through as much of my stuff as I possibly can. Anybody else? Yeah. No, I, you know, the only thing that we ever looked at in terms of gauging um, whether or not we wanted to put on these positions was we used to monitor the VIX pretty closely and we used to look for mean reversion in the VIX and see, but that, 
that got to be a little bit less useful. And now it's like, I don't know if it's just because of time, right? But after doing this for 22 years, you're just looking at the markets and going, all right, I know what's going to happen. And I'm going to sit out this open. But usually it's just a matter of in the morning, are we going to take the trades or not? It's a matter of where fair value is and where it's going to open. And if we're going to defer them at all, it's only for the first five minutes, and then we're going to make a decision, you know, did we get such a wide open that we're just going to take the day off? Now, this next one, this is a gap trade. So when we started with this, um, it's a statistical trade, and it's very different than just going and eyeballing gaps. And what we did originally was we took the implied volatility of the front month's contract for whatever stock we were looking at. We figured out, are we two standard deviations out on an open? If we are, we're going to take that trade. And then we figured out that takes too much uh, brain space, right? And especially around the open, you're trying to get these, these stocks into the calculation. We went and did a bunch of work and found out that true range is a real good proxy for volatility. And it holds up over time. So true range, if you don't know what it is, is just the range of, of price that includes gaps from the prior day. So in this case, instead of the range being the high to the low of that bar, your range would be the high minus the close of the previous session, right? And so if, if it was $50.10 at the high and the close of the previous day was 49 bucks, we got a dollar and 10 at Q range. And that becomes a proxy for volatility now. And you know, you got a couple assumptions. I don't know how many, how many of you guys are engineers? Okay, so it's a statistical model, right? So all you're doing is working on assumptions. You have to assume a couple of things in order to be able to plot the data and get a meaningful result. So the first thing that we're looking at is that volatility is normally distributed. So we've done a ton of work over the years proving volatility is, is normally distributed and that true range is, is a proxy for volatility. So if you accept these things, then that gives you access to this guy, and that is the uh, standard normal distribution. Standard normal distribution says, okay, volatility is mean reverting, and if true range is the volatility that we're looking at for an opening gap to figure out whether or not we're going to look for a reversion, right, then if we go out one standard deviation of what we can expect on average, then we've got 68.2% of the move for the morning that we're expecting, the data points for the morning that we're expecting to see have been accounted for. If we go out two standard deviations, we're at the 95% interval around that move. So we've got, it's not 95% probability of a profit. We've got a 95% probability that we're going to see a shift back towards the middle of that distribution. And the way that we do this is, so I've just got this set up where my software just pulls, and you can do this, you can do this in TradeStation, you can do this in Thinkorswim, you can do this um, uh, with, with an Excel spreadsheet, you can, we've got a, a scanner on the sites if you can't figure it out any other way, but it just takes, I just think it's real important to know what the calculation is, right? I, I don't like black boxes, I like everybody to know just what we're doing. You take day one through 10, so those are the true range values for each one of those days. And then you plug it into a uh, standard deviation formula. We're not using n minus 1 as the denominator. We use n, small sample size. And what you're doing is you just take for each one of those days, it's just that day minus the average. You square it to get rid of the negative number. Divide it by the number of days. We're using a 10-day look-back period. And what that gives us then is the standard deviation. It gives us one standard deviation, 49 cents. So in the case of this data, right, two standard deviations would be 98 cents. And then what you would do is add that 98 cents to the mean. That's how big the gap has to be in order to qualify for the trade. And then after that, we go back to just looking at how the chart performs, right? So we just look at this as, say, those are five-minute bars, right? There's an idealized thing again. And we see a gap down. And then our software tells us that's a two standard deviation gap. Then we just start handling this like a garden variety pullback. So that's why I said we wait for the first five minutes to end. And then I'm looking for, in the case of a gap to the downside, right, I'm just looking for lower highs. And when I get to the lowest high, I'm looking for an entry above that range, right, right above that five minute bar. And then what I target is typically 
the open to the close of that first bar, and then you would look out on your on your right axis again. You'd look for that volume, right? You want that confirmation that something big happened there. Usually, it's the case if they opened it, you know, you know, say that's a fifty dollar open, and then it drops, and you get back up to that price again. Then usually those market makers, are, those orders are still there, and they're going to push back in again, right? So what you want to do is just get out. So this is the way that we pull these together in the morning, right? So we've got these organized. I've got them by S&P 500 and S&P 400 is the only data that I'm interested in. And then I have it filtered in by news. So the important criteria when you're looking at it is the news you want is just garden variety news, earnings news is the best. Right? You don't want to do something where, you know, the, the CEO of the company is sitting in some jail cell in Tijuana, right? That's bad news. That's that's not that's a shift, right? That's no longer a normal distribution. Distributions have shifted on that. What you want is, all right, there's earnings release today, right? Earnings are down, earnings are up, whatever. Market's gonna overreact to that earnings news, right? And when it gets to the reaction point, you're gonna look to trade it. So when you're on the site and you're looking at our scanner, right, what you're gonna see is the things that are segregated by news are off on the right, and then usually it'll while it's active, a little asterisk will pop up to show you that this is a news event. So this was an expectation that Pacific Gas was going to have an earnings decline because they had a relationship with some of these fires, let's say, that we're having, right? That transformer outages and power outages were going on just a few minutes before these fires started, and the speculation was they could wind up on the hook for a lot of this damage. So as this one's set up, right, when you look at this, it's, and when you go into this room and you listen to us talking about these, right, because gap trading tends to be really frenetic when you listen to people doing it. Like they're going, they make this sound like, you know, they're, they're trying to catch a mouse or something. It's, it's very nerve wracking for most people. For us, it's really a, a very simple thing. You just wait for the first bar to form, you wait for the second bar to form. Once the second bar's in, Right, you know your long entry is going to be right above the high of that second bar. You can have a stop. The way that I set the stops is initially I would have the, the stop loss down at that low of that first bar of trading. As soon as the second bar forms and the third bar triggers an entry, I'm going to ratchet the stop up just under the low of the bar that got me in. Right, so very, very quickly we're going to move that stop in under today's price activity. And then I'm always looking at Right, where's all the volume going on? So as it's climbing, right, I can see the early volume at the top of the bar. That's where my target is. And I'm just putting this order together, and then right, once I've got my target in place, what I'm doing is I'm going to go and put together a bracket order. So I've, I, you've got all the time in the world to put these things together. So first five-minute bar is forming. You get your bracket ready. Right? I save my bracket as, as PCGE. I get ready to trade it. I've got my values in there. If the second bar doesn't wind up, because everybody, somebody always asks, well, how did you know the second bar was going to be the lowest bar? You don't. You just have to put the order up, and when the second bar doesn't wind, when the, when the third bar winds up going lower, you just change your order. You change your entry price. All right? There's the other thing. I've, I've, I've had this conversation with a lot of people at Expo. You've got to know your software. You have to know your platform. Like if, if you're fumbling around with a mouse because you're, you don't have an understanding of how to change an order, I, I can guarantee you what that ending is going to look like. Right? You have to be able to manipulate the software. You have to be able to make the software work for you. So in this case, right, the order was, this was, you know, this was the other day, right? So this was a really good trade, right? So this one, our entry price, $27.97 with a limit up at 28.10, so there's about a 13 cent. What I'm doing is I'm looking at the spread on the stock, right, as I'm setting it up. So if the typical spread is gonna be eight or nine cents, I'm gonna give it a little bit more than that to make sure that when it hits that activation level, I can get a, I can get a sweep, I can get into the order. My profit target, $33.22, right, and my stop in this case, $27.53. That is extremely rare that you get a 10 to 1 reward to risk ratio on these things, right? But it happens. So over the course of the, the two weeks that you're in there, listen to these guys, you're gonna see that every day out of that list of stocks, it becomes very easy for people to parse 
and say, okay, these are the trades that make the most sense. These are the ones that I'm setting up for today. And there's no, there's none of this like mayhem. We have just a very orderly, okay, these are the two that we're focusing on. Usually by the time we enter one, it's the only one that's left that we're even considering. Price levels, yeah. So that is the gap trade. You guys have questions on that one? So there's also a course on it. I did like a, because there's usually a lot of questions. We've got like a four hour course that's actually the expo deal um, that you can talk about afterwards if you're interested in that. It's like $100 off um, if you do it through, through the expo today. But it's four hours of just going through and basically what it does is it says, look, there's four acceptable entries. There's three acceptable ways to structure the order, right? It's either an aggressive entry, a standard entry, or, a, or an advanced entry, essentially. But it's all just laid out so that this stuff becomes really easy to recognize and there's no panic. Yeah? I trade fixed share lots. Um, you know, so for us, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, you can go through. We've got guys who, who have been through the boot camp and everything, and, they've, and they do resonate with everything. So they want to trade the whole Megillah, right? They want to do all four different types of things that we do. A lot of what they'll do is they adjust their uh, volume by, all right, if, if there's eight stocks today, I want to make sure that I deploy all of my available trading capital to those eight stocks, and they'll adjust it by the price. So they get the share sizes. You know, One might be 500 shares, one might be 900 shares, 1,000 shares, but it's based on the, the value of the, of the underlying security. For us, we just trade a fixed share lot. So, you know, I'm always working under the assumption that that even though, um, even though there's there's eight stocks on the plan, there probably only four are going to trigger anyways, and I want to be able to move money around and you know take advantage of some of these other trades. So, you can either do a, a position sizing by asset, so an asset allocation model. Look at the at the spreadsheets on the site because it'll show you the impact of both. And what I really like you to pay attention to is with our fixed share lot we wind up at roughly the same place at the end of the year as if you would have gone and done the, the asset allocation pricing. Anybody yeah. else? Yeah. Based on the gap. So I also use like trade the news and I try to listen ahead of the, ahead of the uh, not trade the news, a fly on the wall I'm using now for these things. It's, it's really good as a, as a source and it's cheap. But um, I just like to see who, what the pre-market movers are and what the reason is for the move. And then, yeah, if they scan up, if they come up as being a two standard deviation move, then I already sort of know, you know, it's not a CEO didn't kill a hooker somewhere. This is a stock that's actually moving because, you know, something is. Um, but yeah, so we know as it's opening, we already know what we're going to do. Yeah. Always in and out on the same day. I can't stay in overnight because we, we have a model of 100% of our money is going to work. If you go overnight, you're going to go T3, right? And you're going to get reduced to two to one. You go overnight when you close the position, that money doesn't come back right away. We do it intraday. The minute you're out of a trade, your money is back in your account ready to use again. If you're, if you're you know, T3 is really T2 now, but it still means if you go and close out that position the next day, you're going to have two days until settlement, right? Plus your margins impounded. So we make our living trading. We need four to one leverage at all times. Hour and a half. So she asked if we're out the first hour generally. Usually we're, we're over and done by, by you know, 8 o'clock Pacific. Yeah. I'm all in um, when the trade triggers. We've got a, a couple of guys who, and our PhDs are psychology. So we try to work through things with, with some of these guys. And for some of them, it really is like it's rough to get in in the first five minutes or right on the opening tick. So you know, we'll suggest, all right, well, if you sit out the first five minutes, you're going to be pissed, right, because now it went without you. So how about just, you know, do a lower share size right on the open? And then if it goes to the profit target, at least you got the profit target. And if it starts bleeding back into the range, you can add to it. Um, but we don't scale in the direction of the profit objective. You know, like once it's going, it's going. If it comes back, we might add to it, but we're never, we're never loading up along the way. Yeah, long. Right. Yeah. 
as long as as long as it's a two standard deviation gap in the morning, and as long as you're you're playing it by these rules, right, where you you set up a very tight uh, grip around what you're expecting it to do, then I don't care if it's long or short. You know, if, as long as I've got the parameters figured out where I know where the volume happened, I know where the likely inflection is, then I find long and short to be equal in terms of profit potential. On a lot of the other trades that we do, the short side of the market is definitely, you, you'll see it when you guys go through. I mean, a lot of years we're 80% short just because they move fast, right? And then we get to our targets. Yeah. We have people who trade options. I mean, you know, they, they tend to add this stuff as they go because this is easier to, you know, the options, the problem tends to be the spreads. Um, especially when we're trading, because we're trading a lot around a lot of volatility, right? And, and in our case, it's easy to get a good fill. And for the options guys, the, the common complaint has been, you know, the spreads are lousy or, or it doesn't, uh, you know, they, they wind up taking them out over, over a longer period of time. We've got guys who do spread betting on these things in the, you know, in the UK and everything, and it's the same thing, right? It's, it's just, it's harder for them to fill the, fill the positions. Anybody else? We got a couple minutes left, so I'm going to do this this one quick. But you'll you'll see this um, online plenty. So there is a trade that we do. I told you about that's Apple right off the opening bell. And what what I'm looking for with these is, in my case, I like to just have a couple of bands loaded up before the open. I go through the prior session. You can see on the top that that's the trading plan. Right? So everything we do, like I said, we put it up the night before because we're lousy in the morning. Like, I don't want any decision making in front of me first thing in the morning. I just want to be able to plan things really methodically, and for the most part, they just go off the way they go off. So in the case of Apple, right, this was for, I guess these were all from Tuesday. So this was on November the 13th, and you can see I've got those ranges there. I'm just going to get right into the chart. So what I do is I go and I identify the bands that the stock has been trading in over the course of the session. So Apple, all the super caps, right, all these like 15, 20, 30, 40 million share a day stocks, they tend to get hit with a lot of programs and they wind up in these really tight bands. So what we're looking to do is get a little bit tighter than the program so that we're getting taken into the, into the trade a, a second after they are and we're getting taken out of the trade a second before they are, right? We don't want to go and try to target like the absolute level of, of support and resistance. We want to get a little bit of a, a wiggle so that we can get, we can provide liquidity as price gets to the target or price gets us in. So once I identify these levels, that's what I transfer then to that trading plan. And I try to have three trades, right? I try to have this thing bracketed up so that I've got three trades. I'm always looking at the bias from today when I set up the trade for tomorrow. So if it's a, if it's a day where we have a move to the downside, my bias tomorrow is going to be on the short side of the market. Okay, and when the stock opens, if I don't get, if, if the first thing I look at is the pre-market, where is it trading? Is it close to one of these bands? If it is, I load up the order and then whatever. Right? I just let this thing go and it's going to trade through the way that it's going to trade through. Then on the day of the trading, right, you can see where the violations are. Right? So as, as the stock's moving, like in this case, I wouldn't have had an opening trade because it opened way out of the range. But now, if I shift back, right, you'll hear these guys in the room asking me, what am I doing with Apple? That's because maybe nothing else is happening right now. We don't have one of the, the, those uh, opening gap trades going on. I've got time to shift back and look at Apple. So the second five-minute bar, I see it get up into that volatility band that I, I established. Then what I'm watching for is, okay, how elastic is that level? Right, so I'm watching every time that thing comes up and bumps into that line. What's the reaction? What's the reaction? And when I see that I can't make it up above there, I'm shorting the stock, and all I'm targeting, I don't, I don't make that whole move to the downside there, right? I'm just targeting that next layer of support and resistance, that next volatility band that I set up. And I'll do that all day long, right? And if it doesn't, this one is probably the trickiest of the three trades, right? And I've got a guy who went to the boot camp and, you know, is just hell-bent. He's going to trade this thing for a living. Yesterday, I had four trades in Apple and was up $1,800. He had 52 trades in this thing and lost 600 bucks. So you have to wait. You have to just wait for absolutely the perfect inflection, right? When they come up and they test the level and they can't get through, that's when you're looking for the short in this case. You never, 
just resting a bunch of orders out there and, and you know, hoping you're going to get filled. That's, that's not the way this thing works. You're always waiting for the test, the retest, and then the move to the next level. When it gets to the next level, if it shoots four points without you, you don't care, right? You just come back and you wait. So all day long, you're just sort of laying in wait for this stock. Um, so this one, like I said, look at the plans every night and then just listen in the room, right? Just listen to what I'm talking about. I'll, I'll tell you when I'm looking at Apple. You see a guy in there named Johnny C taking a bunch of Apple trades, just ignore him, because, <laughs> right? Because he's, he's, he's got a little tune-up he needs before, before we're, we're done with him. But, um, all right, so you guys have questions in general? Just anything about you? All five minutes, I do everything from a five minute chart. Three minutes, or like, a lot of you guys like three minute charts, I find them too noisy, threes and ones and all that stuff, there's just too much junk going on. 10 is really too long because you can't find really solid support and resistance quick enough to get you back out of the trade in time, right? Anybody else, yeah? I'm gonna say across the strategies, I've almost always got something triggering. It's rare, so probably three, four days a month, I've got nothing happening. No, um, but for the most part, you're gonna you're gonna get in front of opportunities when you're when you're doing this stuff. Yeah. So the day before, I want to make sure that anything that I'm looking at is trading more than about four hundred thousand shares. It's got to have uh, a price, usually thirty dollars or higher. And you know, I don't even filter by range. After that, I just go through and I start flipping the charts to see what they what they look like. Yeah. I use Realtick um, with Lightspeed. So I've been there. I've been with the same broker. So I was with Terranova from the beginning, and Terranova was sold to Lightspeed, and I just stayed with it. Realtick's the trading platform I like, and it's just because. It, uh, it allows me to dig into the data the way that I want to, plus it's fast and it's broker independent, right? So if I want to go to another broker, I can go to any institutional desk out there and trade with Realtek, I can go to any bank, I would trade with, you know, anybody who, who has a, an institutional trade desk has the ability to use Realtek in their trading. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of them are using Realtek, a lot of them use TradeStation, there's a uh, couple of guys on Thinkorswim, you know, so it pretty much works well with, you know, any platform that's capable. Um, I just use the, you know, that, the way that I started speaking to these things was I used to rep Realtek, I used to talk to people about how to use Realtek in your trading. Um, so I've just been using it for 20 years. Realtek is the biggest of the, yeah, it's the biggest institutional trading platform out there. All right, anybody else? Because I think I'm out of time. I'm going to get yelled at. Okay. <laughs>